Hello, everyone. I'm Mike from The Self App, and thank you for listening to The Self App Podcast. This is a show where we discuss all things good thoughts, good words, good deeds related, and interview people passionate about being their best self and who are helping others to be their best self too. Some of the segments include Coaching Clinic, where we talk to psychologists, motivational thinkers, and life coaches. Book Club, where we discuss and share reviews on our favorite books. Startup Spotlight, taking a pre-seed and more often than not non-techie view on starting a business and running a business. Health and Fitness Hustle, where we provide tips, tricks, and training from experts. And Esoteric Edge, a look at hidden or secret philosophy and how it can help you be your best self. If you haven't already, please download the Self app where we deliver you a collection of tools to help you be your best self. And 3% of all our profits are donated to charity. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Today, it's an absolute honor to introduce you to Laura Greer. Laura Greer is known as the Indiana Jones of adventure travel photography and was named on Discovery Channel UK's 20 richest people in the world list, people who are rich in life experiences. Living overseas and working for the CIA by age 18 began what would become a lifelong wanderlust for Laura. As an adventure travel photojournalist for the past 21 years, she's photographed weddings and travel on all seven continents, making a career out of exploring and documenting the world. Laura's most notable work has been shooting for Novica, National Geographic's catalogue that represents global artisans practicing vanishing arts. Through her work with Novica over the past 12 years, Laura has traveled numerous times to Peru and has fallen in love with the culture and people. Passionate about mentoring, women's education, photography, and travel, Laura leads travel workshops, expeditions, and is an ambassador for sustainable travel brands like Locale and Impact Travel Alliance. Recently, Laura co-founded Andiana Hats with uh, Pat Krisiak. Is have I got that right? Yeah, Pat Krisiak. Fantastic, which is a sustainable fashion brand that works directly with, uh, you're going to have to forgive me, but... Uh, Quechua that, that artisans. Is, Quechua, thank you for overcoming my ignorance. Uh, in Peru, making handmade <laughs> and naturally dyed alpaca. I'm an Australian and I'm going to hide by that fact, Laura, okay? Uh, naturally dyed alpaca wool hats and woven bands. The mission behind Andiana is to empower women to help global artisans continue their cultural traditions, enabling them to support themselves and lead their communities out of poverty. Since the inception of Andiana Hats, Laura and Pats have been honoured by the Embassy of Peru in Washington, D.C. for their dedication to helping the Quechua people yes. in Peru. Yes. And Laura's photography work is on permanent display there. Andiana Hats has also participated in numer numerous pop-ups and storytelling events, including Billy Reed Georgetown, uh, R-O-W-D-T-L-A in Los Angeles, and La Cosecha Market in Washington, D.C. Yeah, so, you said it. Good yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, celebrating Latin American culture. As members of the Female Founder Collective, National Geographic's Women of Impact, and The Good Market, Laura and Pats continue to find innovative ways to create sustainable income opportunities for artisans by launching Andiana Travel, philanthropic trips to Peru. Their first trip launched in 2020 and was featured by Forbes as an origin trip led by successful women founders and also by Matador Network as a company that actually gives back. Laura, you are an absolute phenomenon. The work you are doing has inspired me for the last 25 years uh, of, my, of my life. I am absolutely thrilled to have you on today. And I would love for you to tell our audience your story, you know, taking us right back to where this all started. Oh my God, I mean, I don't even know where to begin, but thank you for having me first. Um, and yes, I've known you for many, many years. You've watched all the iterations of my craziness, but through it all, I think I've always been a wanderluster. Um, I've always been someone just obsessed with travel and traveling from a young age. and. As you heard in my bio, both my parents um, worked for the CIA, so my sisters and I all worked at the Central Intelligence Agency um, in D.C., Langley, and uh, we did a lot of travel growing up. So my parents were stationed around the world, and I grew up in Indonesia. My sisters, you know, one of my sisters was born in Brazil, and my parents were stationed in Thailand and uh, Liberia, Africa, and Rio de Janeiro, and like all, you know, all over the world. So I had that sort of ingrained in me at a young age. 
definitely was, um, you know, coming into contact with a lot of different cultures and languages. And I think that I just wanted to be a photographer because it led me, it was sort of like a tool for adventure. And my mom helped give me that idea of being a photographer. I, I always wanted to be a scientist or a marine biologist or an archeologist or something like that. Cause I think I saw Jacques <laughs> Cousteau and uh, Indiana Jones as you know, what that job would be like, even though it's very, very different. In fact, I just went on an archeological dig last week and it is not Indiana Jones. So it's really interesting, but I, I just always thought of it <laughs> as, as adventure and um, travel. And so photography has definitely been a tool and allowed me to do that. So I went to you know, four years of photojournalism school in New York at Syracuse University. And I studied commercial photojournalism, fine art photography. Mm. And then after four years of upstate New York weather, I think you got a little taste of it in Chicago, maybe. Um, you're like, okay, I think I've seen enough snow for the rest of my life. And I packed up everything I owned in my car and drove to Los Angeles. And at 21 years old and had a photography degree and and no plan whatsoever. I was living out of my car when I first got to Los Angeles. I sold my violin for gas money to make it to Los Angeles. Um, I ended up on a series of ridiculous reality TV shows. Um, and that's how I earned money to be, to get my first apartment. And I actually made it on Wheel of Fortune, the show, and that's, I won like $7,000 and that's how I bought my first camera to start my photography business out here. So um, it's been a very LA unorthodox way of starting a business, but you know, at the time I was, I was bartending and figuring it out. And uh, I knew that I wanted to, to I don't know, I, I knew that I wanted to do travel but I had interned at National Geographic in DC when I was in college. You know, I also worked at the CIA myself during college. So I did both jobs. And because, you know, if you have parents that have been background checked and have top secret clearance, then you've been background checked. And so it was really a lot easier for me to get clearance to work there. So I worked my two jobs. And I think my parents wanted me to work at the CIA. And I wanted to work at National Geographic, but I learned really quickly that it just wasn't, um, Nat Geo wasn't the wasn't the job that I thought it was going to be. I it I would have been away for like years at a time on an assignment. I didn't have any creative control over the photos I was taking. Like somebody, I, I was editing the imagery coming in from photographers around the world, and I remember being like, "Oh my gosh, that's got to be so crazy to be out there in the field shooting for years and you don't even get to see your own work," you know. And um, and so I just remember being a little disheartened there. So I kind of flipped years and um, started doing weddings and events in Los Angeles because it was sort of like happy photojournalism. I, I wanted to do photojournalism, but I didn't want to be out there shooting war and famine and really sad subjects. And um, with the CIA, I would have been photographing people that they wanted to assassinate and things like that, you know, which wasn't necessarily the type of traveling I wanted to do. Um, so I, I kind of got into happy photojournalism, but then the weddings brought me back to travel. Like I started doing a lot of destination weddings, traveling the world, working with hotels, going to really exotic locations. I got certified for scuba diving because I was going to all these places. And, and all of a sudden I was doing this life of travel, um, you know, randomly through weddings. And then after that, everything came back full circle to National Geographic randomly because I was playing in a co-ed soccer league um, five nights a week in Los Angeles for years on, on my Monday night soccer team. I you know be sitting next to the same people putting my shin guards on and playing soccer and I didn't know. So, so everything came back full circle to go work for National Geographic when I discovered that my Monday night soccer team, I was playing in a co-ed soccer league for years out here in Los Angeles. Um, but the CEO of National Geographic's artisan catalog randomly was on my Monday night soccer team. And we all, every day, every Monday would, you know, sit there, put our shin guards on next to each other, go get beers after the game, all that. But none of us really knew much about each other. And I just, I had decided to go on a trip to Peru and had posted a bunch of pictures on Facebook. And he was like, oh, I thought you were just a wedding photographer. I didn't realize you did travel. We we're actually looking for someone last minute. To, to do a shoot for us in Peru. And I saw your Peru pictures and I was like, yes, I can go immediately next week. And I went down there and shot a shoot for them. And that was the beginning of now it's been about 12, 
years shooting for them. And it was interesting how it came back full circle because working for their artists and catalog is very different than working for their main catalog. I have full creative control. I get to work with these amazing artisans. We're only going down for like a week at a time. I'm not away from home for months at a time. And I get sort of my fill. Um, they also do a lot of philanthropic projects and um, happiness projects, they called it. And so I got to go around and like live with artisans and interview them and figure out their needs and, and how they're giving back. And that's how I got to do crazy things like staying on a floating grass island in Lake Titicaca with Quechua Indians and, you know, like doing a homestay with them. And, and so I had all these amazing experiences. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is where the story is. It's like I, I decided to sit down and write about that time I stayed on a floating grass island was the name of my article. And I wrote a whole piece on what that experience was, was like. And then Huffington Post travel, um, one of the editors randomly worked in the wedding industry and she knew me and was like, wow, you should really post this. I'd love to post this and your photos on our, on our site. I'd love for you to be a contributor. And then that was how I started doing travel writing for them. And then it sort of just steamrolled into like all these other jobs. Cause once you start writing as my boyfriend, Matt, who's a travel writer, can attest. All of a sudden you get all these opportunities of people and PR companies and tours and boards and people reaching out to you, offering you free trips in exchange for you writing about them. And so um, all of a sudden that snowballed into a lot of different travel jobs. And it was all really just kind of came fluidly and I'm still doing weddings and I'm still shooting, um, you know, and then also the Nat Geo job and shooting with these artisans is how I started my hat company and how I met the artisans that make these incredible hats. So everything comes back full circle and and I get to now do all the things I love to do in in multiple different jobs. You know, I can't describe myself as one thing. Mm. <laughs> so I don't know. That's sort of like the You're whole wearing long multiple hats. Way. I, I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> to, so, to play a pun no, on I your mean, back I wall, babe. I know, right? Exactly. If you can see me, I've got hats everywhere. And this is actually a small amount compared to how many are normally stacked behind me. But no, it's been it's been a great pleasure. And I'm really glad that I did things the way I did. I, I think at the time when I um, left a high paying job um, with the CIA waiting for me out of college and was living out of my car. I had moments where I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> Why did I choose this? Um, but I look back and I'm like, man, I wouldn't have changed anything. I had the best time in my 20s. I, I understand the value of, of money and hard work because I, I put my time in and I met incredible people on the way and got to have these wild experiences of being on reality shows and game shows and you know, I was on the first season of American Idol, like randomly, you know, just like stuff like that, which would have never happened had I stayed home and never left DC and taken that job. So yeah, it's been a ride. Yeah, amazing. I, and I, I want to touch on something briefly because I, I know, I do know this about you. You're, you're quite a talented musician as well. Um, talk to us about, I mean, your creative vein is is amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the instruments you like to play and 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 how you're using that or still in that that yeah. path? I mean, honestly, for me, singing, playing the piano, and violin have been my three things. I, I, my violin has definitely not been practiced as much because I like I sold it for gas money to get here, so I didn't actually pick up another violin until re a few years ago. Um, to kind of tinker around with it. But the piano I've always had was actually the first thing I purchased. Like the first piece of furniture I purchased, I purchased I was out here living on a, on the floor before I even had a mattress, I bought an upright piano for my apartment. Wow. Cause to me, that's like my way of dealing with stress is I can just sit down and play the piano and it was important to me to have one. Um, but singing has always been a way for me to, to emote and deal with breakups and hard times and good times and I don't know even like last night just going and seeing karaoke at a nearby bar that I love here in Venice it's just it's just it's so fun for me to perform but like I've never really tried to do music as a as a career or anything like that it's just been mm. for me mm. No, well, I, I, you know, I think I love that you touched on how therapeutic it's been for you to have an outlet like that. And I think it's, it's, 
I've been lucky enough to hear you sing and play the piano and, and it's a real treat. And if anyone um, can find any footage of Laura, I suggest you do go and look it up. It, it's <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I want to come back to um, Andiana Hats and, you know, the, the, the reason behind this, you know, one of the things that I, I even in, in reading your bio, um, and since the last time we, we had the opportunity to catch up is the social conscience work you're doing. Can you tell us why um, this is such a passion for you and why um, helping these artisans in Peru really is, is driving you to do what you're doing? Well, when I turned 40, which is just a couple of years ago, um, I had I was going through a really gnarly year of, um, I had major knee surgery. I was grounded for the first time. I hadn't really, I couldn't travel for the six to eight weeks that I was healing, which was like the longest stretch I had gone without traveling and going through a breakup. It was like all these things. I had to move apartments suddenly because my apartment that I loved flooded and it was like all these things happened. I'm like, what is going on with this year? And so I took that time to play a lot of music um, I had my friends come over and do talent shows to keep me entertained. That was a really fun thing, which I need to bring back. Um, but I actually sat and just thought about what are my next steps? Like, what am I doing with my life? What's going on? And I was just thinking like, man, I've done all the things in terms of making money. Not that I'm like rolling in the dough, but you know, I do all these things where I have the freedom to travel and create and earn money. And I have the ability to kind of choose my next step and I'm not in a struggle as much anymore. And I just thought about how I wanted, like every decade of my life sort of has a theme. And I think in your 20s, you're just kind of figuring it out and figuring out your career. And in your 30s, you're, you're focused on, you know, being sort of a badass in your career and just like, oh, like money and earning money and just getting all the things you think you're supposed to have at that point. So I felt like 40, I want my, the word that came to mind was intentional. Mm -hmm. And I remember I said, God, I really want everything that I do in my forties to be intentional. Like the people I hang out with, the, the jobs I decide to take, cause my time is so valuable. I was getting so busy. I was never home. I had to really choose like who I spent my time with, like how much of my time am I wasting on certain jobs that don't mean anything to me. And I, I really wanted to just kind of tighten that up. And so um, I started, I remember I Googled, uh, travel and social good and there's literally a group that was called travel and social good that like popped up <laughs> and the founder of the group was like my knee I, I just reached out to him on his website like i don't know who you are but i love what you're doing and i just want to like chat with you maybe we could have a, a coffee meeting or something it turns out he was my neighbor lived like four blocks away and so we met up i like met him on crutches and we met for coffee and the guy is has been just an amazing resource and connecting me with all kinds of he's like you don't understand how many founders live in our neighborhood of amazing travel companies that are giving back and um there's a uh, travel tales podcast that this guy mike scheibel's doing he's also my neighbor and he just brings together all these incredible um travelers and companies that are giving back and i was like that's amazing and so i just sort of joined that group and started going to their talks and i've done podcasts for them and um raffle items and events with them and they're like launching trips and it's just it's been a really amazing group of people that i was introduced to that were like all walking distance from me and i had no idea that this group even existed and um i think if i, if I hadn't been home long i probably didn't realize that they were my neighbors because i was never home i was never home long enough to get to know my neighbors and um or just take the time to really like research and think about what i wanted to do so um so I don't think it's an accident that I got into that frame of mind. And then my next trip down to Peru, you know, I had all the tools to start this hat business before I'd met these artisans. I, my girlfriend, who's my business partner, who lives in Lima. I'd known her for over 10 years. Um, I had all the tools to do it. I just hadn't been in the same, in the mindset. So I remember going down to Peru on my next trip and I was just obsessed with the hats. Um, that they wear in their villages. All the Quechua villages, each village has their own style hat that they wear. The hat's a very important social um, symbol for them. Um, it can tell you how important someone is, what village they're from, if they're married, if they have kids, how important they are. Like you can all tell that from their hat. And they believe the hat covers their third eye chakra and sort of like their last energy field to, to heaven, to source. And so your hat is also like your conduit to um like for energy into the 
into the unknown, into the universe, right? So there's all these like really spiritual meanings behind the hats, but I just personally started doing a photo essay for myself of women and all the different hats they're wearing. So I had photographed a bunch of them. And I was just going to do like a photo essay on it. And then my girlfriend I was with, we were hiking and I was like, God, these hats should be like back in the US are so amazing. And I was like, I wish that we could just sell these in the US. And then um, it kind of all became like clicked together. Where we're like, wait, we could do this. Like you're down here in Peru, I'm in LA. We, we could like get them shipped, we have them made, like let's figure this out. And, and, um, and that's how the idea was born. It was because she was calling me the Indiana Jones of adventure photography. And I, I was like said to her joking, I was like more like Andiana Jones because we were like hiking through the Andes when she said that. And then we both stopped and we're like, that would be a great name for a hat company. And then we were like, holy oh, crap, so... we could totally do this. Let's do this. And then we just, the rest of the hike, we were figuring out business plans and all that. And then we ended up hiking back down this little village, Oyantai Tambo, which is where our, like kind of our Peruvian headquarters are. And that's where we like built a website in like two days. We sat there and ordered like pancakes and coffee and like met this little family and we just built a website and met with the artisans. And we had we picked out five different hats um, that they had. And I photographed them on my business partner as a model. And then we just came back to the US and uh, started selling them. We had five hats made, that, that was it. We just like put them online and said that there was, you know, pre-orders um, or we were starting to take pre-orders that they would take about two months to get to you because they're being made. And so we took a bunch of pre-orders and that's how we used that money to actually pay for the hats to be made. And that's how we sort of started. So we kind of uh, borrowed money from the from the clients themselves <laughs> to start yeah, the business. Brilliant. We didn't have the money. Really we were like, innovative. I don't know where to begin. No, but that's an yeah. awesome, awesome tip for, for listeners who are thinking about, you, you know, or, wow, I'd like to start a business, but I don't have capital. How can I do it? Well, it's a really clever way of, of funding ahead. So, you know, re really smart, clever workaround for funding. I love it. Yeah, I mean, but it's also true. Like people understand when things are being handmade. I mean, it does literally take like three and a half weeks for one hat to be made. They're all hand shaped and naturally dyed. And if you watch how these women make these hats, it's, it's incredible. They're all like the red color is actually from a crushed beetle. That's how they oh, get the wow. red color. I mean, it's all like twigs and leaves and bark and, and um, the way that they're dyeing everything. So it's pretty amazing. But yeah, I, you know, I think people understand when they're buying an artist, I mean, product, like they get how handmade and how difficult, like you're not getting an Amazon Prime delivery mm. the next day. In fact, we work with artisans in the Amazon and like our Amazon is like, they have to take like an 18 hour bus and like work, you know what I mean? Like it's a very different Amazon. <laughs> Grassroots <laughs> Amazon, not next literally. day, let me tell you. Yeah, that's right. So I want, I want to talk uh, a little bit about, because, you know, as much as, as you are a serial entrepreneur uh, and, and do run multiple businesses, you know, you're now looking to give back. And, and as you said, you know, it was, it was um, travel and, and social good. What, can you tell us what impact you are having on um, the community that you're, you're trying to serve and what impact you might be striving to achieve for them? Yeah, so the, what I think the misnomer is, and I had gotten this idea from reading Richard Branson's, one of his business books, and it was a quote that was pretty in the beginning of the book, actually, and it said, doing good is, act is good for business. And he was talking about how everyone just gets this idea about giving back and volunteering it has to be like sweat labor, really difficult, like it's a charitable thing. These people are so in need and they need the money and they're like this dire straits and, you know, 5% of the proceeds go back to them and all that stuff. Um, we didn't set, we, we're actually a for-profit business and I think people don't realize that you can be a for-profit business and give back and everyone makes a profit, you know what I mean? And everyone wins. And um, so these women, I mean, they have, they're not like horribly upset and it. Like they actually live a very spiritual, happy life. They are, they are poor. They don't have a lot um, and they do need help with like medical and and certain food, especially during the pandemic that they can't grow and like access to things and, and education. Um, but other than that, they, they live off the land and they're, they're pretty self-sustaining, but um, we started a business with them. They get paid first for the hats. Like they set the price. They tell us how long it takes them. We actually help them set the price because a lot of these women had never even used currency before. They just barter with their weavings and had never even understood the value of like, how do you set value to my time? Mm -hmm. So we had, it was almost like something we had to work with the women on to be like, how many hours does this take and what is that worth to you? 
and then um, we pay them and then the onus is on us to like get the hats from these indigenous villages to Lima, to Los Angeles, to market them, to sell them, to go all this stuff. And, you know, so all this on my shelves is, you know, money that we haven't made yet. <laughs> so we haven't sold them yet. Um, you know, but the women have already been paid for all these hats and they get paid first. So um, oh, even during brilliant. the pandemic, when the, when the borders were shut down, we were still able to send them money and place orders for them to make it, even though we couldn't get them from Peru to the U.S. So um, how it's helped their communities is that um, the women before, especially with the pandemic, it really helped because they have no zero tourism and their all their income was coming from tourists buying stuff at the markets. And when that shut down, they had no income. But not only that, the markets, some of them are, you know, a six hour hike from some of their villages. And so these women, these like old women sometimes would have to hike six hours each way just to sell a few belts or like a blanket or something. And that's time that they're away from their family, from the animals, farming, like all the things. And they may or may not sell stuff. And so now like they're working from home. They don't have to go to a market. Um, we come collect the goods from them. We, we work with a nonprofit that hikes into the villages and gets it from them and and they get paid right away so it's just giving them a great quality of life and they're getting paid a lot more than their husbands were for doing jobs like being a guide at Machu Picchu or whatever the, you know things their husbands were doing and so a lot of them have switched roles where the women are the breadwinners and the husbands are staying home and more with the, the kids and the animals and stuff like that so um I think uh it's given a little bit more power to the women and also um, allowed the families mm. to have a better quality of life and we work around their schedule we, we learned in our first year of business <laughs> that um just because you place an order in it, you think it takes three weeks to make a hat doesn't mean that's the case like if it's the dry season or the wet season the hats take twice as long to dry um it might be harvest or um in a quechua festival happening or you know when there's farming and harvest going on like everything turns to the harvest and they focus all their energy on that so we have to sometimes plan our orders around their harvest and weather schedules just to make sure that we're getting things on time and stuff like that, which I've never had to deal with before. <laughs> so there's like a lot of things, but we, we want to like not disrupt their way of life. And that was a big thing. So I had to kind of let go of my frustration with that and go, well, that's the whole point of why we're doing this is to give them a better, to not make them like working in a factory certain hours and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Amazing, amazing, and and uh, look, uh, I absolutely commend you for what you're doing, and it must be even harder um, for so many communities around the world that we don't often think of that that suffer, um, you know, far downstream from from our first world problems of having to you know wear masks and self isolate for a few weeks at a time. Um, one of the things I want to get back to though is is you and you, you know your way of overcoming adversity or or fear in the pursuit of your business career, your multiple, um, you, you know, entrepreneurial ad adventures. What have been some of your biggest fears or blockers that you've um, had to face in in pursuing uh, each of, of your adventures and businesses? Um, I think my biggest fear with weddings um, was always like, what if people just stop calling me, stop hiring me? Like, how am I going to earn money? Like, then what? You know, I, especially in the beginning when I was just starting out, you know, you put a lot of time and energy in before you see any results, especially with weddings, as people book them like a year out. So um, it took a, a while to get sort of business rolling. And I was just like, how am I, how, you know, this is when the internet and blogs were just kind of begin, not beginning, but just, you know, it wasn't as easy. Social media wasn't a thing, you know? So you really had to do grassroots networking and coffee meetings and all those things. And there was a lot of money out in the beginning uh, before you saw any money in. So I think the fear of, uh, of just, I, I don't know, of just not being busy, of people not booking you, of, of failing, I guess. Um, and my other fear was, you know, cause I didn't want to like give up. I felt like, like I didn't want to go back to bartending or anything like that. I it was determined to be like a photographer and earn money as a photographer from the beginning. So I think in my head, trying to earn money in a different way was was going to be a failure for me. So I was really just didn't want to go back to that. And luckily, I didn't have to. Like you know, it took a, I, I think the first year or two I bartended to supplement, and then since then I've never had to 
do anything other than photography to earn money. I mean, other than by choice, like selling hats. Um, but I think what was really awesome about my career is that photography is useful in any any career. Like, I mean, lawyers, everyone, doctors, whatever, everyone needs photography, whether it's for their websites, whether it's for um, social media or just a profile picture to promote them or for an article or whatever, everyone needs it. And so there's never going to be a time where I'm not needed and I might have to pivot within what I'm shooting. Mm. But I think knowing a skill that is always going to be useful was something that gave me sort of solace at times when things are slow. And also like mm. I work in an industry that is, uh, you know, it, it's not always busy. Like we get really slammed in the summer and stuff for weddings and then it might not be as busy in the winter. So it's sort of seasonal and you have to kind of plan out your life a little bit on a very, um, it's not a steady income sometimes, mm. you know, uh, but I, I don't know. So I think there's fear behind, you know, being your own business owner. I don't have, um, mm. you know, that paycheck to count on every week. And if I don't work and then I don't earn money. And so there's a little bit of fear of just of that. But now looking back, it, it's the greatest gift to, to have your own hours and set, you know, I can't fire. I mean, I guess I could fire myself, but I choose not to fire myself. So I have job security <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> so Sound like a pretty good I've boss. never had an interview for a job. I've never, I've literally never gone to an interview for a job before in my entire life. So I hear horror stories about that and wow. I'm so glad I've never had to do that, but I know that oh, that's yeah. not really normal, you know? So, um, but no, I think that there's just fear of failure, fear of, um, not being able to earn money. And I remember I've been mentoring for a long time and there is a group, she was actually a bride, a bride of mine that I shot her wedding, her mom worked for this uh, charity that finds money for college student, like uh, high school students, uh, scholarship money for them to go to college and they pair them up for, like a matchmaking service. And they did these mentoring events where they would have like a thousand high school kids and they would separate you by like tech jobs, cr uh, creative jobs, blah, 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 and separate you. And they we did a panel where we each talk about what we do and blah, 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 and give advice and people could ask questions. And I remember this dad, uh, this girl brought this high school student up to me after the panel talk and he goes you're a photographer i'm like yeah he's like awesome can you please tell my daughter that there's no money in photography and that you're not going to be able to make a living that way like that's what the guy said to me and i was like wow what a dick you know i remember thinking like i'm so lucky that i had my parents <laughs> that were like you could do whatever you want like like anything you want to be you can do and i, I took that for granted that um, not everybody has that. And like this poor girl who's wanted to be a photographer, her dad was like coming up to a professional photographer, like having, trying to like dissuade his child from doing that. And I looked at him, I'm like, I mean, if it were true, I would tell it, but I, unfortunately I make a great living and I love my life and I, I just can't say that. I, I think it's a, you know, and I listed all the ways why photography is a really useful career, blah, blah, blah. And the guy just had nothing to say. Like the father was like, you know? And so, um, but I couldn't believe he said that to me. Like it was sort of insulting, but I was like, okay, take this as a challenge. Oh, All right. shut like, it a down. Lot of people, you know how many people have come up to me at weddings? Like, oh, oh my gosh, you're the wedding photographer. Like, this is like your business. And I'm like, yeah. And they say, so you do this full time. Like, this is all you do. I'm like, yep, I, I, I'm a wedding photographer, you know? And they're like, wow. Like they're shocked that that's a, a yeah. job that can make money, which, you know, wedding photographers make really good money, um, more so than a lot of other jobs. But um, I don't I don't know, it was such a weird thing that people have felt the need to come up to me over the years, just shocked that I've made a career out of photography. I don't know. Well, I think, I think it's a, a, a really amazing point to make, right? And we, we were having a little bit of a, a discussion pre this, the studio where, you, you know, I, I said, I think there is something absolutely critical to to be said for following a passion um, which you took that course it was the road less traveled that that you took and you believed in yourself 100 percent and you know other people elect to go for what they perceive to be safe but it's certainly not um truly aligned with passion and you know there are long-term repercussions for that you know emotional psychological financial even in some cases and um you know, it, it can become a bit of a shock for, for, for uh, maybe I'm going to call it mainstream or can just conditioned thinking that you need the corporate nine to five world to be one successful, two happy, three secure. 
and you've bucked the trend on all of those things and you, you talk about it right I think that yeah. the, the, the coming back to what you were sharing with with us before about how you don't have a consistent stable paycheck um, but that doesn't necessarily mean when you're doing work you're not making really good money that you just have to plan and have to focus and have to budget yeah and do all absolutely. Those sorts of things. Yeah, no, and we, you know, and I, I've made good money in my career and it's just not, um, it's not like a, the exact same amount every week that mm. you can count on. Like you said, you have to budget and and all of that, but yeah, it, it's not to say that you're not making money. It's just, mm. it's just a different level of thinking and planning. And, and what I will say is that we self-employed people, especially single self-employed women, it's so, they make it so difficult, at least in the US to get a loan to buy a place or do anything because you have to, like they want you to work for a corporation that shows a paycheck. Like they don't want to be like, oh wait, you earn this much, but you stated this much of your tax returns and like maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so it does make it harder in other ways to you know own property and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's, you know, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Like I, you know, I own a condo and all of that, but it's, I, it just is harder because, and they make it harder and it's not any different. In fact, I probably make more money than people that show that they make more, but they get a lot more taxes taken out than I do. Mm. So it, it's, you know, it goes both ways, mm. but I, I, I think that the stability weddings randomly was a very stable choice for me. I didn't realize it at the time, but if people aren't shooting weddings or booking weddings that are getting people getting engaged and you're taking deposits. So like you are having a money flow come, come through all year. But I think it was just really important for me to figure out ways to earn income that wasn't just one thing. Like I sell art pieces, I, I sell stock photography, I, um, you know, do family portraits and weddings and fashion shoots and all that. And, you know, now I'm selling hats and, uh, and all of it is like different streams of, of income. And, you know, I think it's just, there's always like ways to make money. I don't know. I just don't understand people that mm -hmm. don't know how to figure out ways to make money. And, and going back to passion, I'm so passionate about the hat business. Like I definitely, um, you know, the first year and a half, we didn't make any money because I was paying myself back and blah, blah, blah. We're not profitable. I mean, the women were making money, but we were like, had to pay our own expenses and stuff. Um, and I think that it was scary, but I also just thought like, this is something I'm really excited about. Like, even if it doesn't work, I'm still doing good doing it. So it's like at the very least, if it doesn't work out, it's like a really fun philanthropic project that I embarked on. And I think that just because I'm so passionate about it, it shows through. I can't tell you how many times people walk by and they're like, I don't look in hats or like, I never really thought about a hat before. And then I tell them the story and explain where these hats come from and like all about the women and blah, blah, blah. And they're literally like, they'll leave with two hats. And they're like, I just fell in love with the whole idea and the intention. Like we have all of the bands and the hats are, we call them intention bands and they're all woven in the Quechua language. So each band actually means something in Quechua. Their language is a woven, and an oral language. So you can mix and match the bands and the hats and choose what intention you want to wear. And people love that. People love it being like a thought, like they will spend a long time in front of the Absolutely. mirror choosing their intention, what band they want on their hat and the whole thing. And it becomes like an experience, you know? And, um, mm. and I think once they hear how excited I am about it and they hear the whole story, then it makes them excited and makes them feel good about purchasing and, and giving back and helping out these women. and. You know, so it, there is something to be said about having passion. Like it actually will help drive sales and business, be, you know, if you have it. Absolutely. So as, as we come towards wrapping up the session, I, I'd love to know, Laura, with everything you've done and everything you are doing and, and with so much that you've achieved, who and what are you thankful for in your life? I just did this gratitude with my boyfriend the other night. Who and what am I thankful for? Um, definitely thankful going back to what I said before, my parents who were never negative towards anything I was interested in or wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Even when I was living out of my car in Los Angeles, they were like, okay then. So um, they've always been very supportive. Um, I'm really grateful for that. And they still are, they're still very supportive. I'm thankful for my wonderful boyfriend. He's my a uh, travel partner in crime and also make sure I'm fed and all of the things. I'm a terrible cook and all those things. But it's it's awesome having someone who understands in my life like my level of need for travel and motion and 
constantly being on the move and thirst for learning about the world and learning about other cultures and just having someone who um, wants to be on the move like that with me because it's that I realize that I'm in the minority <laughs> with how much I move around. So it's nice to have a partner that. And I'm grateful for just having a really big community of creative friends, especially out here in Los Angeles, that are doing all kinds of crazy jobs from, you know, from dance to music to soul coaching to yoga to an ayahuasca, owning an ayahuasca retreat or like whatever it may be. Um, I literally have this amazing group of creative artist friends that are always doing different things and inspiring me. And I think that that's important to have inspiration around you and people around you that are always just out creating and stuff. It, it helps me out. Um, and then I think I'm just really thankful for having freedom in my life. Freedom's always been, um, and I'm not trying to sound like all American, like freedom, but it's um, it's really just the freedom to, in even a stage in my career where I can make creative decisions, I can try new things, and if they fail, it's not gonna make or break me. I can, I have the freedom to come and go as I please, to travel, to um, collaborate with people, to, to sleep, to work, to not work, whatever, I have the freedom to do that. And I think that that's um, something that is really, I'm really grateful for in my life. And it's allowed me to, to try a lot of new things and, and be very happy. And hopefully that keeps me, really that keeps me young now that we're, 40. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's just not forget about the rest past the zero. Yeah. It's just 40 so, I mean, I don't know. I just, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And I've, and what's so crazy is that like two years ago when I started the business, I guess it's about two and a half years. Ago, yeah. A little over two years ago, I look at pictures from just a couple years ago and I can tell when I didn't have my business cause I was wearing a different hat. And, um, and it's so weird to be like, oh my God, like three years ago, this company didn't even exist. And it's been such a big part of my life. So it's really interesting to know that you can still have something that's life changing and you never know what direction your life's gonna go in and who you're gonna meet, what what's gonna happen, even in your forties. Like, and I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't even looking for a career change. I'm, I'm not, I'm a photographer, but you never know what's gonna happen. And that's kind of exciting. Amazing. So as we close up our session today, I would love to know um, from you to share with our audience a key piece of insight or advice that you can offer them to help them be their best self. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to go back to, I think all of us have unique skill sets and things that we're good at, things we're not good at. I think recognizing what you're good at and using those talents to help others. So like think bigger than yourself. I think when I thought about photography and what am I good at? I'm good at you know, networking or talking to people or connecting people, travel, I'm a really good traveler, photography. I started thinking about how could I help others? I started mentoring or I would just build in a philanthropic um, angle to all of my photo workshops. And I don't know. I just realized that you can take the things that you do already and like add another element where you're doing more that has something bigger than yourself, whether you're working with a group or an organization or a charity, or you are, I don't know, giving, giving your talent to people that need it for pro bono or something. Like, I just think that, um, there's ways to be creative and to do the things you're already doing and really good at, but on a larger scale where you can be helping others. So, um, I think every business can take a look at themselves and be a little more sustainable. I think everybody that's earning money can figure out a way to give back somehow. And I think a lot of people think you have to be older, like, oh, I'm going to wait till I retire to, to volunteer and give back and do all that stuff. And I think that's the wrong attitude. I think anyone can do it now easily and build it sort of into their, their life and their business already, you know? Um, even corporations, like they have corporate responsibility where they have to give back I and mean, people have to spend a certain amount of hours, like their employees giving back and um, doing charitable things. And I think that, you know, that like people need to think that way and have a little bit of like the social responsibility built into their life somehow. But I don't know if that's like advice of, of just, I think you could just look at what you're doing and do more, I guess would be the advice, but like not in a way that's stressing you out, but just it'll make you feel good. And I think when you're 
giving back or, or part of something that's greater than yourself that like a lot of doors open up and you're going to find a lot of meaning behind what you're doing absolutely well laura it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you on the show to share all that you've been up to and all that you're giving back to the community um if people want to find out more about about both your wedding photography and andiana hats can you share the two websites that they can go to for us yeah well, technically i have more than two but my my travel fine art photography website is just my name laura greer.com g-r-i-e-r and my wedding photography is beautiful day dot photography and then the hats is andianahats.com, which is A-N-D-E-A-N-A hats.com. Um, and you can find us on Instagram as, as well. So yeah, no, I'd love for you to check it out. A lot of my Peru photography is on the Andiana Hats site too. And you can watch some videos and see the women and um, learn more about the intentions. It's fun. It's a fun website. Absolutely amazing. And for our listeners, uh, I'm going to try and um, get a showcase on our website of one of the tools. I, I'm in love with Andiana Hats and the Intentional Band. So I want to share that with our community, but I'll also be putting the links in the podcast for awesome. those that are watching on their phones. Um, to our audience, thank you so much for listening. And before you go, I ask you to do us a good deed, share this with one other person, and please leave us a five-star review wherever you tuned into the podcast. For more best self-goodness, find us on social by searching for The Self App. And from us to you, keep up the good thoughts, good words, good deeds, and continue to level up your best self. Thanks, everyone.